Hello everyone, this is Megan with Northwest Rett Syndrome Association and I have here with us today Pam Lindemann from the IEP Advocate. Pam has a great presentation for us. She's an expert on IEPs and wants us to be experts too. So she has graciously allowed us some of her time and she's going to take us through the, what it says, the five domains of the IEP and then she's gonna leave us some room for questions and answers at the end. Thank you so much for being here, Pam. Well, thanks a bunch. I, I appreciate the offer and it's a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, you're way up there in uh, the northwestern part of the country. I'm, I'm way down here in the south in Florida. So we're yes. opposite ends. <laughs> yes, we are. So, um, I, you know, I work with families who have children who need support from the public school system. So we work in helping families get 504 plans and IEPs. We help them uh, develop them so that they're better than perhaps they have right now. And we help children qualify for them. And one of the biggest, um, one of the most popular questions that parents have is, you know, what, what um, can that school actually do for my child? How can they actually help? So in looking, I thought the thing that we could do to get started is just look at the basic services that the public school system can provide for a child. Um, and the areas in which they can um, provide those services, because a lot of times there's a lot of things that schools can do to help children that you would never that you would never realize. Um, blah, blah, that's me right there. I have an organization of advocates um, throughout the state. We actually help families across the country, but we are based in Florida. So many parents ask, how am I supposed to know what the school is able to do? Where do I find a list of what's available? The school won't tell me any, anything. It's very frustrating and it is extremely aggravating sometimes because you don't know what to ask for. You know your child needs help. So I would tell you, generally speaking, you can ask for anything if it's what, you know, if you believe it's what your child needs in order to be successful in school. And what I mean by that, there, there is no finite list because every child is unique. Every child's um, um, IEP is individualized. And I, when I do meetings and people will say to me, well, we've never done, the school will say, well, we've never done that before, or we don't do it that way. My response is always, well, you may not have done it before, but this is this child's unique need. This is his or her individualized education plan. And so we need to look at what their individual needs are. And just because the school hasn't provided it for anyone else doesn't mean it can't be provided for this child. So every IEP can include five domains and that are intended to cover the special services and supports provided in an educational setting. So we all know that public school districts do are responsible for curriculum and learning, right? That's reading, writing, and math. That's the academic piece. But school districts, public school districts, right? Because everything I'm talking about has to do with public school districts. So public school districts can also help children in the area of social or emotional behavior. This has to do things with social skills, things like maybe if your child has anxiety, stress, um, is uh, very, very overcome by going to school. Some kids can't get to school and behavior challenges that they might have. Um, independent functioning is another area that schools are responsible for. This has to do at the youngest ages, this is potty training. This is being able to toilet independently. This is eating independently. This, um, as children get older, we're looking at, can they organize themselves? Can they use a planner? Can they um, follow multi-step directions? Um, can they, do they turn their homework in on time? Are they able to take a big project and break it down into smaller, more manageable pieces? That, it, that's independent functioning. Occupational and physical therapies also fall under this category. Healthcare. Um, you know, most of the time this is dealing with children who may need nursing services, some kind of medical attention. It could also be uh, medication being given to, um, you know, to a child at school. And communication is the fifth area. Uh, that's speech and language, how we use sounds and words and sentences to communicate our thoughts, how we understand what people are saying to us 
and how we get take our thoughts and express them to others. And not just orally, but it's also in the written word as well. Um, not every child needs services in every domain. So you may have a child who has a learning disability and needs support in reading, maybe math, but they don't need help with organizational skills. They don't have any social skills issues or behavior issues. So they may not need a service in every domain. Very few children need help in the um, healthcare domain, but it's there for those, for those that do. The, the domains, um, the, the areas of service that a child needs fall into um, the domains that the school can provide those services. Again, if a child doesn't need something in a certain area, then it's not mandatory that it be provided. So let's just kind of talk briefly. Curriculum and learning addresses services provided to the student in the areas of curriculum, instructional strategies, and learning environment. And I always say, you know, reading, math, and writing. So the, the child's reading skills, how they do math, how their writing skills. Now, writing is has two parts. One is the mechanical part of holding the pencil and actually drawing the letters. And the other part is getting your thoughts onto paper. And sometimes kids are good at writing mechanically, but they can't properly express their thought on paper. So anything having to do with academics falls under um, domain A. And this includes instructional strategies that include specialized approaches and methods for delivering and differentiating instruction, specially designed learning activities and the incorporation of universal design for learning. Basically, this is how does the teacher teach? Is she teaching in a way that your child can learn? Uh, if a child needs a lot of visuals, then perhaps her instruction would include a lot more visuals than, um, than she would otherwise include. It can be visual schedules. It could be um, could be giving notes. You know, um, if a child's diff having difficulty writing things down, maybe the teacher, um, you know, if she if she's putting things on the board, maybe the the student can be some. I had one student who, I don't know how it was, but she learned really well when she could write on the board. So for her, the teacher taught her a little differently and she was always writing things on the board. It's whatever the student needs. The learning environment includes assessment procedures, testing, things like that. What does that look like? Materials and equipment, including assistive technology and accessible instructional materials, classroom settings and schedules. So let's talk about these for a couple of minutes, uh, for a minute. So assessment procedures, for example, if your child does not test well in a larger group or they need to be separated for testing, they can be separated. Maybe they can be in a small group. You need to make sure that what you define what a small group is. Sometimes we put on an, we want a child in a small group of testing and the school will put, you know, in a small group to be determined or they don't put a defined number. Well, we make sure that there's always a defined number for the small group. If your child can only test in a group of three kids, then you need to write that down. She can only be tested in a group of three children, okay, with a familiar adult. Um, learning environment has to do with the way the, the room is set up, where your child sits, where your child sits in relationship to other children. I've had children where their desks are at the back of the room just so they could stand up and walk back and forth. They never left the classroom, but they had sensory issues. They needed to be able to move. And uh, so we moved their desk to the back where um, this one particular student could stand up all the time. And he just walked around and that kept him calm. He had a lot of sensory issues and uh, they did that. I had one little guy who had a lot of sensory issues. We actually put his his desk, if you will, was in like a tent, a tiny, a small tent, he's a little guy, but he needed, he was so hypersensitive to light and sound and touch that we actually set him up in his own little tent and that's, he could hear the teacher and everything. She was amazing. So um, assistive technology, this might be, you know, could be a computer, it could be, 
you know, fidgets, it could be, you know, smaller things, you know, squishy seats and things like that, you know, to things that are much more technical on different, different computer programs, teaching children how to use those computer programs and those types of things. So these are some examples of what can be addressed in curriculum and learning. Uh, if the student requires small group instruction in order to meet goals, uh, teacher or support facilitator working with the student in the general education classroom on a regular basis. So somebody can push into the classroom and work with the student if that's what works best for that student. Some students don't do well if the teacher pulls, pushes in and they have to be pulled out. But other children, you know, parents don't want sometimes it, for their child to be pulled out of the classroom. They want somebody to be pushed to push in. It's all based on the individual needs of the child. Uh, teacher designed individualized curriculum for most learning activities. So if a child is in, not able to keep up with the um, regular curriculum and perhaps that curriculum needs to be modified, simplified so that the student can understand it, that's a possibility. Uh, and of course, paraprofessionals providing ac academic support in the, in the classroom or not. Um, I will tell you we have this big thing in Florida where the school districts love, love, love to tell the parents that we don't do, we don't do one-on-one uh, -on -one paras or extra paraprofessionals with children in the classroom. We just don't do that here. And that's just not true. And I'm not saying, I, want, I don't know if they're telling you that in where you're living, but if they are, it's just not true. Um, if it can be proven that a child needs a para in order to learn, in order to engage, in order to um, and participate, um, and not just academically, if a child needs a para to help support them socially, to get along with other kids, to make friends, if they, if the child needs a para in order to help them engage um, with other students, um, academically or socially, then there's a million reasons why somebody, um, why a student may need a para, and not necessarily full time. It can be a one on one para, or it could be a part time para. Consultation between teachers regarding the curriculum, instructional strategies, and learning environment with regular scheduled meetings. You can have a, um, you can have on your child's IEP that perhaps the teacher meets with the speech language pathologist every week uh, to uh, to talk about the child, the student. So if um, let me give you an example, we've had um, children who are are uh, verbally impaired and um, are getting speech language therapy. And the, the therapist comes and treats the child, but um, the teacher is doing a lot of um, interventions in the classroom to help foster that development. And so what we put on an IEP is that this, we wanted, I didn't want the teacher and the therapist to kind of pass each other in the hallway and say, hey, how's Mary doing? Whoa, Mary's doing fine, thanks. I wanted them to actually sit down, take notes and talk about the child and what's working and what's not working and what has to be changed, if anything. So on the IEP, we wrote that the therapist and the teacher meet every other week for 30 minutes um, as a consultation and they have to document it about the child, about Mary and how she's doing and what, if anything, the teacher can do uh, to improve what she's doing. Uh, some other examples are low vision aids provided or the use of electronic tools such as a computer calculator, a grammar checker um, that can be used with assistance, use of study guides, copies of teacher's notes, frequent notes or um, progress reports sent home. Here's the thing that, um, you know, if your child forgets to send in their homework and they're not sending in their homework, um, you know, get it written on the IEP that you can email it from home to the teacher directly and step, instead of having to turn it in. We, we bypass a lot of problems by just having the student email their homework into the teacher the night before. We, the amount of assignments that get turned in on time um, significantly increases. Okay, let's talk about domain B, social or emotional behavior. This includes services provided to meet identified social and emotional needs of students with exceptionalities. Services included in this domain address positive behavioral support, behavioral interventions, social skills development, socialization, and counseling as a related service. All of these services fall under this domain. 
Behavior interventions include the use of behavior analytic techniques, such as reinforcement, you know, or consequence procedures, teaching replacement behaviors, behavioral contracting, timeout level systems, all of that, whatever, whatever um, works best for the student. The point is that the school district has a responsibility to help children who have behavior challenges. Now, when I talk about behavior, I talk about a spectrum. I refer to it as a spectrum of behavior. At one end of the spectrum, we have kids who are very violent. You know, they're, they're, they'll break things, they'll hurt themselves, they're at risk for hurting others. Um, and, and those are children who have a lot of intensive behavior needs, okay? But behavior at the end of the spectrum is just being off task. If your child is off task, doesn't follow directions, she has a hard time um, following with the group, she um, maybe isn't, she's not complying very well, she's not able to stay on task, you know, for just a few minutes. Those aren't violent behaviors, but they are inappropriate behaviors for a school setting. And if we have children with that challenge, I mean, we request behavior plans, we, we request quests functional behavior assessments, which is a data gathering process about behavior. Why is it happening? How frequently is it happening? Um, what happened right before the behavior? What happened after the behavior? And all of that data needs to be collected to determine what's happening. So just, it, just even a student being off task, some a child who needs a lot of redirection, a lot of prompting, um, I would encourage you to look into getting a behavior plan and getting the district to intervene and um, create a plan. It, makes, it can make a big difference. Social skills development includes instruction on relevant social self-regulatory skills, as well as individual or group counseling. Um, you know, this is, if it, your child has a hard time getting along with, with if making friends, getting along with peers, um, doesn't understand how to converse with the peer, can't have a really good conversation, doesn't like to play with friends, um, anything having to do with social skills, school districts have an obligation to provide those social skills. Now, it's easy at the younger level, you know, you think of social skills groups or, um, you know, with, when you're thinking of smaller kids, but even as kids get older in middle and high school, kids may need, you know, may need help making friends, keeping friends, getting involved in friends. Um, I worked with a family, I've worked with a family for, for oh my gosh, 12 years, she's graduated. And um, uh, her name is Emily and she has Down syndrome. And I started working with her when she was in kindergarten and she recently graduated from high school. That little girl was in every school activity you could possibly think of, including all the football cheerleading, basketball cheerleading teams. And um, she was so socially engaged and her mother worked really hard with the school to make sure that every year little Emily had some kind of activity where she was out with other kids and she was, you know, she was communicating with them. And um, she was a very, very popular little girl. There's all types of things that sometimes you have to get the school to think outside the box, but there are things that they could do, you know, to help children feel engaged. Counseling as a related service refers to counseling that the IEPT determines is necessary in order for the student to benefit from exceptional education and that is provided by qualified personnel. So school districts have, um, do have the ability to provide mental health counseling. It's a related service, meaning that it, uh, a child who already has an IEP who qualifies for an IEP um, in another category can receive a counseling. Um, as a, as, a, as support. So, and that can vary from child to child. It could be a short-term thing. It could be a long-term thing. Behavior management is um, the use of behavior analytic techniques, such as reinforcement, consequence procedures, behavioral contracting, timeout and level systems. This is so critically important. I have seen some children make incredible turnarounds in the school system because they got a behavior plan and the school put together a really good behavior plan. You need to find out in your district who makes, who puts behavior plans together because districts are different and they have different, um, a, a different process for that. So for example, some people 
in the school district when they do a behavior plan, it might be the teacher, the guidance counselor, and I don't know, maybe the ESC teacher, they all get together and they say, okay, let's, you know, let's look at little Lucas here. He's got some behavior problems. He's off task. And we're going to, we're going to give him, he loves Star Trek. So we're going to give him little Star Trek stickers in order to um, motivate him to stay on task. Well, maybe the Star Trek stickers don't work anymore. Then what do you do? And then they may say, well, we could try this and then we'll try that. And it's a very haphazard approach to trying to figure out how to motivate a child to do thing, to do something. Well, there are people out there in the world who study behavior management. Um, they're called, uh, they go to school for this, they learn this, and they're called board certified behavior analysts, right? Some of you know that. Board certified behavior analysts. These are people who live and breathe behavior. These are people who get up in the morning and want to go to work with someone who doesn't want to work with them. They want to work with a, a, a student, a child who um, is belligerent and mean and nasty and is trying to get away from them. I mean, they live to try and understand behavior and how to get um, change that behavior to a positive way. And these are people who just study behavior. Personally, when I'm requesting a functional behavior assessment in order to determine what kind of a plan is needed to help a student, I always request a BCBA, a board certified behavior analyst. Uh, in fact, in a couple districts, they don't even ask me anymore because they know what I'm going to ask for. They just go ahead and approve it. And um, you want, I want that level of person working with my clients because there's no time to waste. I want people who live and breathe behavior to come in, assess a child, go through their process with fidelity, meaning integrity, and properly determine what the problems are and how to help a child. There is no time to waste, right? We, we have to stop wasting time with the school district. It takes forever. And so whenever you can do something to make things a little more efficient and move more quickly, then I'm all for it. Socialization, social skills that must be acquired through specific training or the provision of opportunities for socialization that require substantial planning. So some examples of services are functional behavior assessment and the development of individualized behavior intervention plans, social skills training, specialized activities focused on goal setting and decision making, and consultation with teachers, family, and agencies. So these are all things that you can have on an IEP. You can have social skills groups, social skills training for your child. You can have the team get together once a month, once every other month, and have a discussion about how is everybody working together for the benefit of your child and is what they're doing working. You can have training and self-advocacy and understanding of exceptionality. So this is working with students, um, making sure they know how to self-advocate for themselves. Um, they can have regular counseling or guidance. Either the student meets individually with the teacher, a guidance counselor, or mental health worker regularly to discuss, behave, to discuss behavior or skills. It might be group counseling. Again, it's what's ever best for the student. And it could be a highly structured behavior management plan. Independent functioning is the next area. And this includes instruction and organizational strategies, assistance for activities of daily living, self-care, eating, you know, toileting, um, taking care of yourself, taking care of your materials, you know, your school um, possessions, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, orientation and mobility training, and supervision of students to ensure physical safety. Please, if you have a child who's a runner, if you have a child who will elope, if you have a child who will wander off because they see some shiny object and they're no longer in the line for the classroom, they're in some other place on the campus. If you have a student who will see something and just take off like a shot because they think it's fun, whatever it is, if you have a child who elopes, if you, child, if you have a child whose physical safety is compromised, you need to make sure 
that there is something in place to take care of that student, to make sure that it's documented, to make sure that there's a plan in place. And sometimes some schools will say, um, well, it doesn't happen all that often, or they just think it's funny. I had one, I had one woman on, in the school. We had a, a found out that we had a, one of our students was eloping because he thought it was hysterical. And the reason he thought it was hysterical was because this poor woman, this teacher slash guidance counselor, it was her job. She'd get in this little golf cart and start following him around the campus. Oh, she always had her eyes on him, but she'd follow him around the campus in the golf cart because the poor thing could never have kept up with him running. And he thought that was the funniest thing. And then we found out this was happening so often. Um, you know, that's not appropriate. So we had to intervene and put an end to that little scenario and uh, end his playtime. So make sure there's a plan in place. Instruction and organizational strategies refers to instruction or materials needed for a student to function independently in the general education classroom or to have access to their education. So this is instruction and organizational skills such as time management and use of organizational checklists or assignment notebooks. You know, if your child is disorganized, you can't just hand them a planner at the beginning of the year and say, voila, you are now organized. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work that, th that way. When we have children who need to learn um, how to be organized, how to use the planner, how to use a checklist, turn things in, um, we're usually requesting that somebody work with that child usually once in the morning, have a check in and check out once in the morning and once at the end of the day, just a few minutes, but to say, hey, where's the where's the paperwork that you were supposed to turn into biology? I don't see it. Or how come all these papers are crumbled in the back bottom of your backpack? Pull them out, flatten them out, put them in the folder. Let's put them where they belong. Someone, someone needs to do that on a con consistent basis. You can't teach someone organizational skills one time a week for 15 minutes. That's not going to cut it. You need someone working with that child in the morning and in the afternoon every day until they start to grasp the skill. Then you can reduce the service. We're not always very popular in our meetings when we request that, but um, but then they take the staff takes such great pride when the student can you know start following a calendar and they and they should be proud of themselves but it takes a lot of intensive effort in the beginning physical therapy which deals with your gross motor skills um refers to um a program that's directed towards the physical development improvement and restoration of you know your neuromuscular or sensory motor function relief of pain control of postural deviations to attain functional performance in the educational setting. The key word there is functional performance. School districts are not interested in perfect performance as they might be in a clinical model. They're interested in functional performance. If you can get from A to B, no matter how you can do it sometimes, that's fine with them. Occupational therapy has to deal with your fine motor skills. This has to do with things like handwriting, fine motor skills, opening a milk carton, opening a juice carton, closing something, open um, a jar, op you know, opening a zipper, putting on clothes, um, things like that. Those are all fine motor skills that, um, that the school just district can address if there's a deficit in that area. Orientation and mobility training refers to the teaching of concepts, skills, and techniques necessary for a student who has a visual impairment to travel safely and efficiently through any environment. I put this in here because a lot of parents don't realize that districts have uh, vision impairment departments where they have specialists who have experience working with children who have visual impairments. Um, and that means that there's a big resource there in the school district. So if you have a child who has a visual impairment, um, then you need to seek out that person, have them come to a meeting. So for example, I was just in the meeting for a girl who has dyslexia and um, uh, they, she needs a lot of accommodations because her eyes are very, very, it's not just dyslexia, she's got severe vision impairment. And so the whole team is talking about this accommodation or that accommodation, or how are we going to give her, um, how are we gonna read this back to her? They want type increase. How are they gonna look at, take a type face, a type font and increase the type size? And I said, you know, I think you guys need to talk to your district bring your district uh, vision specialist in 
um, into the meeting and you know ask for ideas because this is this is what these people do every day and they can they can look at a vision report and understand what it means from an eye doctor and be able to um, come up with ideas and suggest suggestions for children who have um, vision impairments. Supervision or monitoring of students includes the observation and reporting of independent behavior, as well as the provision of direct supervision and assistance to ensure the physical safety of the student and compliance with school regulations. Basically, that means the school is responsible for keeping children safe, whether that's um, direct supervision. Sometimes on an IEP, we write that a child has to be within arm's length of an adult at all times um, because we want forever, whatever, it may be the child's a runner or, or whatever, but that child has to be within an adult's um, arm's length um, at all times. Sometimes we write that on an IEP. If a child's got to be in a group, no more of four kids for whatever reason, we write that on the IEP. Assistance for activities of daily living and self-care includes um, reminders, cueing, direct instruction or personal assistance in toileting, eating, and personal hygiene. Those are all things that public school districts are, are responsible for. Um, if you have a little one and you need a potty training program, I remember one time I was advocating for triplets who had autism and we, we spent a whole day designing three individual toilet plans for these three little boys, all of whom who were very different and had different reward systems. You know, some, one was rewarded by this tiniest, uh, tiniest pe microscopic piece of a Cheez-It cracker. That was his big deal. Another wanted a Skittle and another I think wanted a, a, a um, sticker. We created three potty charts we created reporting systems to the parent. I mean, everything was documented. Every child had his own visual schedule, you know, how you pull your pants down, how you pull your pants up, the whole thing. Um, so a potty, um, and then we coordinated it with the parents. So the parents at home were following the exact same potty schedule they were at school. It was quite an amazing thing. But at the end of that school year, all three of those little boys were potty trained. Healthcare. This has to do with um, healthcare needs that that children have. I'll just kind of go through this. Um, so school districts are responsible for following for supporting kids who have medical conditions, and it can be anything you know, asthma, seizures, um, um, recovering from cancer. I, I say that because a lot of families don't know that. You know, they've got children who are going through cancer treatments or coming off cancer treatments, they've got to go back into school. Um, I just advocated um, successfully for a little boy who's very medically fragile, but he's a spitfire and his mom wants him to go to school. And she went to the school at the beginning of the year and said, you know, he needs a nurse. And they said, well, we don't have a nurse. You, you're going to have to, uh, we don't have a nurse to provide um, you know, you're going to have to keep him home because we can't provide a nurse. And uh, and she called me in tears and she's a full time nurse. And so they thought, well, you could come to the school and who like what mother wants to go spend the whole entire day with their child at school? I mean, you need that break. They need to be in school. And so uh, long story short, she got a nurse. The school district ended up providing a full time nurse and get this because she also wanted him to take the bus because he loved the bus. So we got the district to agree to um, provide a nurse. The nurse met the mother, met at in the morning, went to the family's house, parked her car, got in the house, picked him up, put him on the bus in his little wheelchair, put him on a special bus. She rode the bus with him to the school, got him off the bus in the school, spent the whole day with him. And at the end of the day, got him back on the bus, got him home, delivered him in the house, and then drove her car back home. And that's what, that's what was able to happen. Um, we, we got her, you know, we got her um, all the way for the whole entire day. Amazing thing. The mom just cried at the end of the meeting when we got it all taken care of. It was huge. Uh, requires periodic personal assistance, monitoring or minor intervention. Um, assistance with monitoring of equipment, 
uh, related to healthcare needs, and that could be a G tube to a nebulizer to an oxygen tank. I mean, we're talking very severe here, but the point is that the school's obligated to do it. Communication with family, physician, agencies. Um, so if you have to have regular communication between the school and the doctor, you can set that up. And counseling with student or family for related health care needs. <laughs> I apologize, I recuperated. Uh, health care can also include periodic observation and review by a nurse or regular monitoring of a student's health condition. So this might be things like blood pressure, weight, temperature. This little guy who's medically fragile, they're taking his temperature every two hours as he's so fragile. The school district can do, um, can do all of those things. Finally, communication. This has to do with uh, per, um, include services provided to support the communication needs of students with exceptionalities, such as personal assistance, instructional interventions, speech or language therapy, and the use of alternative and augmentative communication systems. So somebody, a student might need an adult with them to help facilitate communication. Even though the therapist is therapy once or twice during the week, whatever it is, that student may need additional help during the school day in order to participate in school um, because maybe their um, the communication skills are very low. And communication addresses services provided to the student in the areas of receptive and expressive use of language as compared to same age peers. So a receptive is what I understand you're saying to me. Expressive is basically what I'm saying to you. And speech and language therapy involves the treatment of disorders of language, speech, sounds, fluency, or voice that interfere with communication, pre-academic or academic learning, vocational training, or social adjustment. You have to be very careful. If your child gets speech and or language therapy, do not, this is a very common thing that happens. After the child has therapy, let's say for a school year or maybe two or whatever it is, at some point, what will invariably happen is you'll have a meeting and they'll want to dismiss your child from speech or language. Don't let them do that. Do not let them dismiss your child from speech or language without um, them doing an evaluation first. And that also goes for like physical therapy or um, occupational therapy, any kind of service that they're providing. Make sure they do an evaluation to prove that that child no longer needs the service. Uh, what can be addressed in communication? It can be a personal assistance for communication may be provided by an interpreter, a teacher, speech language pathologist, note taker, speech language assistant, or by a paraprofessional. Um, and then consultation and collaboration with teachers and speech language pathologists, such as, um, as well as direct instruction. I wanna explain something here. So you see here, it says consultation. Consultation is not, um, a consultation and collaboration does not mean that the teacher or the therapist is working with your child directly. So sometimes parents will get on an IEP, they'll get you know, language therapy um, uh, once a month consultation. And they're thinking that the therapist is working with their student, with their child directly on speech therapy. Nope, that's not what's happening. When you see consultation, what that usually means is that the therapist, let's say your child's speech therapist is communicating is talking is consulting with your child's teacher and that might be you know once a month for 30 minutes or once a week for 10 minutes and what they're doing is they're you know passing somewhere in the hallway or they see each other and the therapist says to the teacher so miss teacher you know how's greg doing and uh, she says oh he's doing well you know um 
uh, he's having a hard time, you know, talking to his friends, but I think we're, we, I think we're making progress. And the speech language therapist says, well, that's just great. Well, let me know if you need help. Okay, great. Thank you. Bye. And that's the consultation. No one's working with your child. Be careful. You want like direct instruction on the IEP, direct, you know, direct instruction is a teacher to a student. It could be direct instruction in a small group or it could be one-to-one. -one. Uh, be very careful on the services page that you read what, what the description of the service is. Oh, we can also have communication be instructing the student in the use of alternative and augmentative communication systems, sign language and speech reading, includes the use of electronic and non-electronic tools and individual and classroom amplification systems. Ah, okay, that ends my presentation. We're here to help. So this is how you can reach us. If you um, get on um, our email list, if you send us an email and just, just says, you know, put me on your list, we'll add you to our list. Um, also too, I will tell you every Monday night, at six o'clock Eastern time, Monday night, six o'clock Eastern, I do a phone call, it's a free phone call. It's like a webinar, like we're doing now. And people can call in and ask questions and I answer them. So anything having to do with an IEP or a 504 plan, I can't look at your child's specific document, but if you have a question, I just sit there and I answer questions and help parents sort through things. So. If you send us an email to this email address and just say, send me the webinar info, we'll send you the link to that. And once you sign up, um, you're good to go for every Monday um, until we stop, which will probably be all the way through the school year. All righty. So Megan, I'm here. I don't know if you have any questions. If we- um, um, Yes, there, there's a few questions. Okay. Um, Firstly, somebody in the chat had asked a question, their child. So I know that you didn't have a lot of time to kind of look into kids with Rett syndrome. Um, our kids, it's a neurological disorder and all of our kids are in physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech. Um, most of our children cannot walk or talk. So they're pretty, um, I guess you would call IMP, IEP intensive. Sure. Um, so our, our first question, uh, our attendee says, thank you for this presentation. Our child with Rhett uh, has complex communication and physical support needs, has had a supportive inclusive environment through elementary school. Uh, they've had a one-to-one -one aid and specific staff, staff training are some of the things that have made this work. And now they're preparing her to transition into middle school next year. And so they'll be spending more time in a self-contained setting. Uh, they know the middle school teacher and her future uh, teacher of record, which is also known as the case manager in some places. Um, but the rest of the middle school for a complex child feels like a mystery. Um, they don't know how to envision her middle school years. And what are your suggestions to families who are approaching this sort of transition? So, just for clarification, the family doesn't know how to approach the middle school years and or they're concerned about how the school is going to work with their daughter in middle school? I imagine both, yes. So one of the things you can do is um, you can draw on the resources of the school district. And if, if your daughter is going to a school where you don't feel like anybody really understands her, what her needs are, how to communicate with her, how to teach her, anything like that, then I would ask for someone from the district to come to that classroom and work with that teacher. And it might also be a, um, could be a teacher, a district resource teacher. It could be a district speech language therapist or a behavior person. You can, you know, your, your resources aren't just limited to the school. And there's been lots of times um, where we've had some situations where I didn't really think like the team got it. And so we would ask for someone else from the district to come in and spend some time with that teacher or that team and figure out a plan of how to help that person. 
you can also ask for those people to attend IEP meetings. So you can ask for a district representative um, to come to your meeting and help give ideas. And also they're good to have because they can authorize funds. So if something is needed that maybe is a little out of the ordinary, they can have input into that as well. It is, I mean, well, you guys, I mean, you're used to this anyway, but it is in middle school generally, it's constant, constant, just constant communication. So, and here's the other thing too, in middle school, you know, the serve that doesn't mean when you transfer to middle school, services drop just because they're in middle school. And it doesn't mean sometimes when you go to middle school, the schools will say, well, we don't provide that here or we're not set up to do that here. So we don't, we don't put that on the IEP because this is how we handle it. Be very careful when that happens because um, uh, if your child, if that's what your daughter needs to be successful in school and um, that's what needs to be on the IEP, I always tell people it's the school district's responsibility to, um, mod to change itself according to what the IEP needs, what the IEP states. It's not the, I it's not the IEP's job to change to what fits the school. The school's gotta modify and change based on what the student um, what the students' needs are. And so they can't just arbitrarily or category say, well, we don't do this. No, wait a minute, let's talk about that for a minute, so. Okay, um, and then I'm going to allow one of our attendees to talk. She has a question, just a second. Um, okay, Lexi, go ahead with your question. You're muted. Hello. Oh, I think she just disappeared. Um, okay, while we wait for Lexi to come back and ask her question, um, another one of our attendees asked, uh, she said, my nonverbal ret girl is only getting speech through Zoom as the school is small and they don't have an on-site SLP. Obviously this is not working and she has lost communication skills. She uses an eye gaze device, so. Um, so the school. Go ahead. So the school is obligated, an IEP is obligated to confer a benefit. The child has to benefit. If, you're, if your daughter's not making progress with that methodology of speech, and um, then the school has to come up with something else. If she's regressing, like you said, and she's not meeting her goals and she's not making progress, that has to change because she has to, an IEP, confers a benefit, the child has to progress. And if that method's not working, then they gotta figure it out. If they don't have a, if they don't have a speech language pathologist at that school, if they don't have one available for whatever reason, they can contract with the private one. That's my opinion. They can contract with the private to find someone in the community that can come and teach her face to face if that's what they have. But they have to um, they have to teach her. It's not enough to do it. If it's not going that way and you have the documentation, and I'm sure you do, to show that she's not making progress, then you need to have a meeting with the school and say, this isn't working. She needs someone working with her, you know, face to face. That's good. And then what is um, I mean, for somebody who's having issues with their IEP and, and needs aren't being met, what would be the, the next step? For, for parents? So if you're having an IEP meeting, if it's not, if it's not working with the school, then um, you can ask for a district representative to show up in, to your meeting because a lot of times people at the district level in the special education department, they, they know what the laws are. They know what they're, they're supposed to be doing. Not that they always follow them, but Many times there's a lot of things that they can do to intervene that will um, solve a problem that maybe somebody at the school level doesn't know how to do. The other thing is you have to understand that the people at the school level have minimal, minimum authority. They really can't do anything these days in most school districts unless the school district allows them to do it. It shouldn't be that way. And I don't know if that's your district or not, but that is what I'm seeing across most of the country. So 
that, that meaning that the people in the IEP meeting who are supposed to have the authority and the complete decision-making authority when it comes to an IEP and giving services, they don't. So sometimes you got to go above the people in the meeting in order to you know, bring someone in who, who is able to manage the meeting better and make progress. If that doesn't work, you can always file a state complaint. And um, state complaints can be incredibly effective. Um, it is one of your options as a parent that, um, that you can choose if the school isn't working with you, working with your child. Um, every, it's through your you know, State Department of Education, you know, Google and figure out um, your State Department of Education filing a formal ESC, Exceptional Student Education, formal ESC complaint formal special education complaint. It's relatively simple to do. Um, they always give you directions for, on how to do it. But state complaints get the, um, we use them extremely effectively uh, down here in Florida, extremely effectively, because school districts don't want the state to know their business. They don't, you know, they don't want the state looking in on things. And you know, the state will call them and say, hey, we've got a complaint. We need to talk to you and figure out what's going on. So um, you might want to look at that, look at that as well. You need the best thing you can do is document everything. Document everything. Don't, you know, if if you're talking to somebody in the school and they tell you, okay, we're going to do this, you you get on your phone, you send an email and say, hey, I just left your office. Mrs. Principal, thank you very much. Um, I'm so glad you know you confirmed that you know that Mary is going to be getting extra speech therapy every week with this other therapist, which we think would be more effective. Whatever it is, and send an email documenting it in writing. That's a great idea. Um, I have another question here from a parent. Uh, can parents request to train their child's one-on-one -on -one aid in the use of the child's uh, specialized equipment, technology, or even getting familiar with our child's communication? For example, our girls uh, are nonverbal, but that doesn't mean they don't communicate. Each of our kids communicates kind of specifically to them. Um, is that something that can be put into the IEP? Absolutely. So you can have a training day. You know, you would be there, the speech person, you can have everybody there, or, you know, a couple hours or an hour, whatever it is, get all the right um, school staff there as well, and make sure everybody's trained and they know, you know, how she communicates, how she says yes, how she says no, her likes, her wants, the whole thing. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so that's something that can definitely be put into the IEP so that their yes. aid is, is trained. Okay. Yep. Um, and then I have uh, just a few more minutes here, if you don't mind, we've got a couple more questions. Sure. Um, what kind of equipment technology and training for those items can be covered in the IEP? I know earlier you mentioned that if the student needs it, the, the school district pretty much has to provide it. As far as assistive technology? Um, yes, or equipment, like for example, some of our girls need uh, specialized desks or uh, standing equipment, things for, for physical therapy, or yes. just in order to be engaged in their classroom. Absolutely. So if, uh, if they need a special desk uh, for whatever that is, then the school district has to provide it. If they need a piece of equipment, a piece of therapy equipment, school district has to provide it. If they need special toileting um, system, they have to provide it. If um, your child needs a computer or a communication device, um, those are things that can be provided. I, um, one time years ago, I had a teacher who um, couldn't print, he was an ESC teacher, lovely guy, couldn't print pictures um, off of his, printer because he ran out of ink and the school he said they won't buy me ink and I sat in the meeting and I said really and so <laughs> he was printing get this he was printing dots okay and and he could and in order to show the color of the dot he printed these circles and then color them with the marker 
Um, and then he ran out of markers and the school wasn't going to buy him anything. And they were showing these kids blank dots. And so we had it written in the notes that the school got him his own printer and his own ink because that was the only, because this child had to learn colors and couldn't learn colors if she didn't have color ink. I mean, that's an extreme. I've had uh, school districts go from one school, bring equipment from one school to another school. It can be a computer. It could be a switch toy. It could be, you know, any anything, a recording device. Um, you know, it could be a, a big, one of those, it's called a, the big red button or whatever, a recording switch device, which kids can hit and it's got a recording on it. It could be a computer screen, a special keyboard screen. All of those things are fair game. Okay, that's really good to know. Um, okay, so with our last just one minute here uh, of your time, where can parents go for more IEP resources? Um, I know you offered up that webinar, which is a really great, um, a really great resource for a lot of us. Um, but are there any other suggestions that you have for us? Um, probably um, there's one called Rights Law, which is spelled W R I G H T S law rightslaw.com and you can um you can um rightslaw.com it is a great website for everything special education and um so you can go to that website they answer all kinds of questions pete wright is a nationally known attorney very easy to read an excellent referral I will tell you, but when it comes to writing goals, um, I, I go and I Google, um, you know, if I want a, a language goal, for, if I want a language goal for a child with Rett syndrome, I would Google language goal for a child with Rett syndrome, you know, IEP language goal for child with Rett syndrome. I do that all the time for all kinds of different things. I don't like to recreate the wheel. If somebody's done the work, I want to use it. So um, I would encourage you to do that. Um, other than that, um, I don't have any other specific resources that I can think of. Okay, um, that sounds really helpful to us also. Um, I know we're at the end of our time here. So I just wanna say thank you again so much for your time in this presentation and answering our questions and um, you know, just being a big help to us. Oh, you're very welcome. I wish you all the best. Thank you so much, it's a Pam. Pleasure. Um, Take care. And have a wonderful day. Oh, thanks, Megan. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone.